I'm going to talk about my passion, plastic surgery. Uh, I was almost born into plastic surgery. I'm from a, a medical family. My father is a plastic surgeon. My uncle is a plastic surgeon. My brother-in-law is a plastic surgeon. And uh, I'm the fifth generation of, third, of surgeons. And it, it's just an absolute passion. I, I, I think it's a wonderful specialty. And I'm going to try to sh help you understand that it's really not at all like we see in the TV shows. It's not nip tuck. Our next speaker is an innovator and an artist, but maybe not quite the kind of artist that you might think right now. He's actually a young plastic surgeon and he is chef de clinique um, in plastic and reconstructive surgery here in Paris. And his work actually really impressed me. Um, I'm curious to learn more about the artistic innovations that he is working on because they do very visibly make a difference in a person's life. Please give a big applause to Alexandre Marchac. Ah. Is the mic working? Yes, it is. Okay, so he told you that I was going to talk about plastic surgery, and most of you, well, the guys probably imagined that you were going to see girls with silicone boobs, and the girls were thinking, well, maybe I'm going to learn how many years I'm going to be able to go back in time. I'm sorry, but we're not going to talk about this because plastic surgery is much more than just anti-aging. And I'm going to show you something much more impressive. Actually, 90% of plastic surgeons perform both aesthetic and reconstructive surgery. And there are multiple reasons why we keep doing that. I think that one of them is because it helps us to stay creative. We fuel the two fields with ideas and it helps us to treat our patients better. And so my goal today is to make you change the way you see plastic surgery. And to do that, I'm going to show you two examples of the little revolution that we had in our field in the past decade. The first one is about breast reconstruction. And that's mainly in case of breast cancer. And breast cancer happens in about one woman out of nine. It means that in this room, there's about 400 people, let's say 200 women. There should be a little bit over 20 women who will have breast cancer. And that's huge. And that's what happened to Mary. Uh, she's a 38-year-old she's a consultant. And two years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had her breast removed. She had chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And now she's considered cured. And despite this wonderful victory, it's very hard for her to go back to her normal life, to her central self, or just simply going to the beach and wearing a bikini. Now, we have multiple ways to help Mary. We can you know, put in a, breast, a silicone implant, but it doesn't give a very good result in this specific indication. Or we can try to use Mary's own body to reconstruct her breast. A breast is basically made out of skin and fat. And where do you think in Mary's body do we have an abundant source of skin and fat? Any idea? Her tummy. And actually she was considering having a tummy tuck before she had the cancer. So the, our little revolution is called the DIEP. It's the Deep Inferior Epigastric Perforator Flap. I'm going to explain what it means because for you, of course, it's all gibberish. Uh, these perforators vascularize the abdominal skin and they are branched from the deep inferior epigastric vessels. And we can locate them before the surgery with a scanner. It's like a GPS. Then we, play, we locate them on Mary's belly before the surgery. And during the surgery, we can dissect the vessels inside the abdominal muscles without injuring the muscles. And we take this entire piece of skin and fat, we set it free, and we hook it up to the torso, to the chest. To do that, we need ni microsurgery. And I'm going to show you a little video of what microsurgery is. We're going to do a big zoom now. Uh, now this is, okay, a little emotion here. <laughs> This is, this is an artery, this is the deep inferior epigastric artery, and we're suturing them under the microscope, zoom 40, okay? And I'm suturing it with very tiny instruments that are actually jewelry instruments. And the thread that I'm using, well, you can't even see it with your own eyes. It's so small. I'm placing between eight to 12 stitches all around the vessel, which is an artery. And so when I remove the clamps at the end of the procedure, the blood comes through, you know? And I do an artery and then two veins, and it allows the blood to come through and to, well, just 
this free flap is not free anymore. It's attached once again to the body. So that's, that's microsurgery. And then all this piece of skin, we have too much, so we remove the excess part and we shape it into a breast. And we can go from no breast to a breast that looks like hers, that feels like hers. There's no silicone implant into that. And she got a tummy tuck. <laughs> now, uh, this surgery was done six months ago, so she still has scars, but scars will go away. You know, it takes about a year, and this will be her breast for her entire life. So that's our first little revolution. The second one is something that I really adore. It's called ear reconstruction. And I had the grand chance to be working with Françoise Firmin in Paris, and she's a master in ear reconstruction. There are only a handful of surgeons who know how to reconstruct an ear. So you're wondering, why reconstruct ears? What's the need? Well, there are kids who are born like this. This is Jeanne, she's 10 years old, she's a very pretty girl, and she was born without an ear. And it's not that uncommon, actually, one child out of 2,000 is born like this. She doesn't really know where the sound comes from, but otherwise that's her only problem. Well, the other thing is that she doesn't really want to go to the swimming pool, or she's afraid when, winds when wind blows because she doesn't want anybody to see that she misses an ear, and she's actually concealing it with an earring. We could replace what is missing by an implant, but it probably wouldn't last for her entire life. Or we can try again to find something in her body that would replace what is missing. And what is missing? It's cartilage. And there is an abundant source of cartilage in her ribs. So we can harvest this cartilage and give it the shape of an ear. But an ear is not a flat structure, and I've carved this in foam to make you understand that an ear is a three-dimensional structure. It has curves, hills, and valleys, and this is what you need to reproduce if you, if you want to create an ear. So we are carving the piece of cartilage and adding little pieces onto the other, suturing them with little wires to give it exactly the shape of her other ear. And then we put it under the skin, and miracle, here comes an ear. And that's for her entire lifetime. Thank you. Now, if you like this one, wait for the third one. <laughs> this one is even more impressive. I've shown you in the two previous ones that when something is missing in your body, most of the time, plastic surgeons can find somewhere else what is missing. But sometimes, there's just not enough in your own body. And that's where face transplantation arrives. We're taking something from somebody else to put it in your body. And I have the great chance to be working at Pompidou with Laurent Lantieri, and he's a pioneer in face transplantation. And I'm going to tell you the story of Pascal. He, uh, he is a very, very exceptional man. And he was born actually almost the same time as me. He was born in June, I'm born in July, with the same age. He was born a very cute child with a very common disease. It affects one child out of 4,000, and it's called neurofibromatosis. And usually it gives small little skin tumors. But he has a very severe form of neurofibromatosis, probably the worst form we've ever seen. And as he grew up, his face grew distorted. He has this gigantic tumor that affected both sides of his face. And he had multiple surgeries. He was operated by great surgeons, but just nothing could help it. You know, it would grow back and grow back. And in his late 20s, he looked like this. And, you know, you're all struggling in your lives, wondering, what am I going to do? What career am I going to have? All the choices that you have in front of you, well, how much would they be reduced if you had the same genetic disease? You can wonder. So he went all the way, and Lantiri did an amazing surgery, which, uh, in which he removed the lower part of his face, and a man did a beautiful thing. Well, actually, the family of a man did a beautiful thing. He was brain dead, and he, as he was giving his liver, his heart, the family said, okay, you can give his face to. And he gave the lower part of his face, and we connected the vessels, the nerves, the muscles. It was a long, long surgery. It took 27 hours. And at the end of the surgery, Pascal had a new face. And this is how he looked after the surgery. It's a whole new face. It could be a lot better. I mean, it was the first of the seven face transplant that Lantieri did, so he didn't transplant the eyelids, but it was already so much better, and it changed radically his life. He found a job, you know, he, he's even buying an apartment, 
And one of his greatest pleasure now is walking in the streets without being unnoticed. And he likes that so much that you probably, you didn't notice it, but he's been sitting there the whole time. And I'd like to say hello, Pascal. And so I've shown you today three revolutions in plastic surgery. And of course, there are many more. We're very creative people. I haven't talked about fat grafting. I haven't talked about aesthetic surgery. And you know, aesthetic surgery, if you apply the same kind of care that I've shown you today to your aesthetic patients, if you try to stay natural, always use your own body, well, you can achieve some pretty amazing results. But you know, what I want you to remember is that plastic surgery is not just about making people look prettier. It's about changing lives. And if some normal people dream of plastic surgery to look exceptional, well, there are also some exceptional people who dream of plastic surgery to become normal. And that's where we can really make a difference. Thank you. This was, probably, this was probably the longest applause we had so, so far for the day. I hope that created an emotion, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're being in the plan. Um, I, this idea of mm. having, having not normal people look exceptional, but having exceptional people look normal. Mm. Are there many people in your profession who, who are sharing this same belief with you, or would you say you're more the minority? No, I think we're, we're a majority, and I think most plastic surgeons, we, you know, uh, some plastic surgeons, at the, uh, at, after long years of practice, they stop doing reconstruction. But that's, that's really a minority. Most plastic surgeons keep doing reconstruction and aesthetic surgery, and really there's, a, there's an equilibrium between the two because actually there's no clear frontier between what is aesthetic and what is reconstruction. We address our patients the same way and we don't really see it as a superficial. You know, everybody has a, for everybody being, your appearance is important. That's why we dress, that's why, you know, we, our, is a, our appearance is very important. And so there's no clear frontier between what is the aesthetic surgery and the reconstructive surgery. I find this a very impressive message. Thank you very much. Alexandre Machac. J'ai eu le malheur et le bonheur euh, d'avoir des échecs qui m'ont permis de remonter. Euh, Aujourd'hui, j'ai la chance d'être là devant vous avec euh, mon nouveau visage, ma nouvelle apparence, ma nouvelle vie.